Hello and welcome to KennyRoy.com. I'm Kenny Roy. This is the video lecture for the month of June 2012. Um, welcome to all the new members. I know this is the first lecture that a lot of new members are actually seeing on uh, KennyRoy.com because of the webcast. We've got a lot of new members. Uh, there is another webcast. Uh, it's not going to be too timely if you're watching this, but um, um, welcome to all the new members from the latest webcast on ergonomics as well. Um, so uh, this lecture is entitled Working with Plates. Now there are a lot of considerations when you're working with plates. Uh, I first want to say that it is a huge amount of uh, in information in terms of acquiring and formatting your plates and that is normally the job of a visual effects supervisor and uh, your layout and your setup people, your pipeline TDs and such uh, at a visual effects studio and you're not really going to be working that much with really like the technical details unless you're at a small boutique and you're kind of wearing a lot of hats. Um, things like film back, uh, things like uh, lens information, that kind of stuff is, is um, normally left up to um, visual effects supervisors and that, that whole layout team. And um, as animators, uh, we don't normally touch that kind of stuff. So what this lecture is going to be about and really try to um, cover is all the things that you need to consider if you're working with plates as an animator. And some things that you can actually do as an animator that make the job easier for the people around you um, and some things that you can think about that will, will in, in some ways set you apart as an animator in terms of how much you're thinking of things uh, that are uh, not really kind of like taught actually. Not, 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 you're not exposed to these things until you're on the job and you're at a studio. So I want to run through all those things. I want to show you, um, want to show you, you know, the the current thinking, the the up to date thinking, excuse me, on on those issues, and um, hopefully you'll get a lot out of it, and you'll have a great time, and um, and it'll be cool. So the first thing I want to start, I want to just launch into, is that working with VFX plates means that you have a background image. Normally it's live action footage, although sometimes it can be a uh, plate that is actually assembled from CG elements itself or miniature footage. Um, sometimes it's a, a, a composition uh, from all of those elements and um, other times actually the plate is generated from what you do, uh, what, what, what like camera move you do and, and, and those kinds of things. So. Um, so there is a wide, whole wide world of, of working with plates uh, that uh, you might be exposed to. I've, I've said very often that you know, the games industry is always is constantly growing. Um, a current trend though that people are starting to talk about is that um, console and PC games, um, while, the, while the revenues are staying quite high, there are less uh, new uh, uh, sort of, um, shall we say, uh, less, less new markets being created in those, those industries because there are free-to-play uh, uh, phone games and mobile games and iPad games and those kinds of things and there's a lot of money to be had in casual gaming and mobile gaming uh, that the, um, the, uh, the large AAA titles on like Xbox or PC that re might require a lot of um, character animation are, are kind of uh, not disappearing, but you know there's, there's just not as many new um, jobs like that being created. So I've I've always said that in, in in character animation that you have if you want to work in games that you have a pretty good chance if you have the skills and you work hard that you will be able to find a, a job in games. Um, and the second thing I said was that probably the area that most um, animators will find um, work in at a, a more broad range of skill levels is in advertising, mostly TV commercials. And there is a lot of character animation in TV commercials and a lot of visual effects in TV commercials and uh, a wide majority of all of these have live action plates. 
So it's a great idea since that is the sector that you are most likely going to find work in. Uh, uh, that, that if there's plates that you should have some exposure um, to them. Uh, the next uh, uh, area is probably um, TV visual effects, television visual effects, episodic, and um, probably after that is probably film visual effects. And film visual effects of course has um, it has the most uh, working with plates and uh, you know is going to be the area where what we're talking about today is the most applicable although the amount of jobs in the uh, especially high-end film visual effects you know there's only one ILM there's only one Weta there's only one Sony so um, the, the amount of jobs is actually a lot smaller so you have to be a lot better to get a job there. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that there's, if you take into consideration how many jobs there are in feature, uh, creature effects and visual effects, uh, and, but the amount of plates that are used in that, and then compare that to like advertising, that it kind of, like, uh, kind of is all evened out. So again, this is all just more support for the, the, the idea that you should know about it and start working with it and be comfortable with it and all these great things, okay? So we're going to, uh, this is kind of an over, overview of what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about it. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple just, uh, just you know, glossary terms um, and tell a few stories about plates that, um, that have to do with these terms and then I'm going to show you some plates and then I actually uh, have uh, permission from a production company that I work with. Uh, we, we get raw plates from them and we deliver them back uh, um, animated, obviously completely you know, fully animated scenes. Um, I have their permission to um, give out these uh, plates. So I'm going to go through a couple plates and I'm gonna decide which one I'm going to uh, give you guys and it will be included with this lecture. Okay, and so it'll be a Maya scene file with a camera that's tracked and it'll be a JPEG sequence um, of a plate. And because uh, I want to, uh, I want to encourage you guys to have uh, as much experience as possible, um, I'm having Sonia right now actually uh, extract all of the plates that, we, um, that we've worked on with this one production company and set up and strip out all of the important um, uh, information and so that we can um, actually put these in the store. I'm gonna be selling them for something really, really low, like six bucks or five bucks or something like that um, per plate. And if you are in like, for instance, the Animation Mentor Animals and Creatures Masterclass, um, these are perfect for you. Um, normally they'll contain a camera, a plate, and some tracking geometry, not a lot, but some tracking geometry that um, you can cast shadows on or whatever. Um, but uh, the most important part about this is that it is a VFX plate that is tracked that you can take all these considerations and get practice with. That's what I want. So look out for those in the store. Um, they're, they're going to be coming up in the next few weeks. Well, depending on when you watch this, they're probably already in the store. <laughs> but um, over the next couple of weeks, suffice it to say, after recording this, we started putting them in the store and there they are. So the first real issue that I want to talk to you about, about working with plates, is the issue of, um, we'll go through all the technical stuff, like how to load a plate and, and all the things you do need to know about the technical stuff about a plate. Um, but again, normally like things that are very, very specific to the camera and the capture of the plate, um, you're not gonna have to worry about. Um, so these scenes will be set up correctly for you to just you know, reference your character in and start animating um, like it will be at a large visual effects studio. So we won't talk about that. But um, the first actual issue is um, scale. Um, the first thing that you need to know is that if you're working on a visual effects film, that scale is a huge issue. And when you have a plate, a lot of the visual reference that you have for the scale of the character is given to you. That means, though, that you can't cheat against that. You have to be extremely uh, careful 
how you're dealing with scale when you're working with a VFX plate. One example is this. We were given a plate once. Um, I'll uh, actually show it to you uh, when, we, when it's time to, uh, to, time to uh, go to the, the, the plates. Um, I'll definitely show it to you. But um, I'll describe it to you now. We were given a plate and basically the character was supposed to go from, from pretty far away right up close to camera. Well, the issue with scale is that a character's stride length has to be kind of, I mean, it has to be, um, it has to be real, it has to be able to be real, right? So a character that is, is like, let's say 10 feet long, it was a dinosaur, it's like a raptor kind of thing. If it's 10 feet long, it can't have a 50 foot stride length. Why? Because to shoot forward 50 feet means that the foot has to be on the ground for like 0.2 frames. It needs to like, like shoot past so fast that the character can't do that. So what we told the uh, what we told them was, listen, we have to scale this character up if we want them to go from all the way where you want him to start to uh, all the way up to camera because. Um, we can't cheat scale. So when you get your plate, you first thing that you need to make sure is that it was basically shot with the right scale in mind. And a lot of those time, a lot of the time, the cameraman is given direction, and they're kind of like imagining where the character is going to be. And if they don't have um, scale in mind, you're going to have to do a little bit of magic. So here's like the first anecdote about this. On Kong, in the Bronto Stampede sequence, there is a, uh, a few shots, actually a, lot, a majority of the shots were shot miniatures. And the way a miniature is shot is used a motion control camera. Why? Because they want to make sure that they have the tracking information perfect from that camera. Okay? So they would... Uh, take down one of the walls of this cavern that they built that the brontosaurus are supposed to be running through and they would move the camera and the thing is is the camera was supposed to be about four feet off the ground so it was looking up okay and it was supposed to get like the shoulders and head of the people running but behind them towering over them was these huge brontosaurus so we were looking up at, at these just gigantic things as these characters were running. And then it would cut to um, shots where the camera was pointing downwards, but still about four feet off the ground, where it almost looked like the camera was like, just like skidding along the canyon floor, and the guys were looking just behind them. All right, so here's what happened. The canyon was built at like 1 20th scale. And at 1 20th scale, four feet becomes like six inches, okay? Um, maybe it wasn't, well, six inches would be one-eighth scale, okay? So let's say that it was built at one-tenth scale, okay? So just under six inches, like four inches. The problem that occurred was the camera had an arm underneath it, and that arm holds up the camera, and you can't take that off. And as they were dragging it along the ground, they realized that the camera could only get about 10 inches off the ground. So all of a sudden, once you go back up to that you know, one quarter scale, once you, once you, or sorry, when you go from one tenth scale back up to full scale, in Maya, the camera was scale floating at about 10 feet off the ground. So all of our digit doubles, you know, our, our Jack and our Ann, and actually Ann wasn't in the, in the canyon, um, but all the sailors and, 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 and whatever were running down the canyon, all the digi doubles, and the camera was just like up here. It was just like over their head, and they were, they were tiny. They were, like, they were like three feet tall, okay? Or to put another way, if the camera was supposed to be four feet off the ground, these characters were like three feet tall. But if we kept the scale at what it was supposed to be, remember we're talking about scale here, if we kept the scale at what it was supposed to be, then the, 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 the camera was about 10 feet off the ground. So what we had to do is we had to select the entire scene 
all that tracking information and the characters and we had to blow everything up. And what ended up happening was because we blew everything up, there was supposed to be way more dinosaurs in that canyon than ended up on film. Way more. But instead of running, they were supposed to run like three by three, you know, shoulder to shoulder down the canyon, we had to scale everything up so much that they ended up only fitting too, too wide in the canyon. So if you watch that sequence back now, this is the Bronto stamp, Stampede down the canyon in, in, in King Kong. If you watch that back now, look for two things. The first is that look, look at the shots that are, tra that are tracking backwards and looking, looking backwards as they, as they move down the uh, canyon and the characters are running towards it. And look how slow it actually is because we scaled everything up instead of the camera running, you know, basically like two feet off the ground in scale, two feet off the ground at like 30 miles an hour. Now it's running like four feet off the ground at like 10 miles an hour. So watch and pay attention. And you'll see even the shots that have live action characters running in them. It almost looks like they're running on a slow treadmill, huge scale problem. Okay. Another one interesting thing is that I compared all the photography that we were getting back from the miniature set to what I had seen um, a few years before in Jurassic Park 3. And I thought that on JP3 they did a great job. That's when I was at ILM. They did a great job with scale. And the reason is, is because everything they shot, they shot as if it was a uh, or even everything that was digital, they shot it as if it was a person holding the camera on his shoulders. Especially the fight between the Spinosaurus and the T-Rex in the beginning of the movie, you notice it's like a 13 second shot, it was beautiful. There was like tail going over the camera and like people crawling through the logs and, and, and it was just all happening kind of like low and looking up, okay? Um, beautifully, beautifully, beautifully done. If you compare that to the entire like 10 minute long sequence when Kong is battling three T-Rexes, it all doesn't feel big because the camera is kind of floating 25 feet off the air, or off the ground. It's at Kong's shoulder level and basically the way they're moving is almost as if they're, they're, they're not um, with you know, the, the right scale. And this is not the fault of the animators. This is because the plate was, that was given to us was not given the, basically the, the consideration that it needed to with scale. One more quick anecdote. Right when I arrived, we uh, had a couple weeks to just test out the rigs and, and whatever. And the first rig that actually came out of production was, uh, was the Brontosaurus rig. Um, and uh, so we started on that and one of the animation supervisors, his name was Atsushi, he, um, put, he set up the scene where there's a Bronto on a uh, platform and the platform just tips because they were preparing to start the Bronto stampede sequence and they wanted animators to just animate this Bronto like it, it losing traction and then trying to stay on and then falling off. Well I anim animated mine, I blocked it in like a half a day. And I actually impressed myself. I was like, wow, this like really came together. But what I did was, is I actually put a camera on the ground, scale like six feet off the ground compared to what, what, how big this Bronto is supposed to be. And I pointed the camera up. So it was almost as if this platform was tipping down towards us and we were seeing this thing fall. But when it was finally free of the platform, when it had finally actually slipped off, it fell like, it took like three seconds to fall. And I knew that that would either look, if, if you knew about scale, it would either look like slow-mo, uh, if you didn't know about scale, but if you did, it would look like this thing was huge. Why? Because gravity affects all things the same. And so if it takes three seconds to fall, that means that if it hits terminal velocity, it's going 180 miles an hour or something like that. By the time it hits the ground and if it takes so long to hit the ground, it must be so big that the distance it covers looks like a short, like a short distance or looks like slow motion. I hope that makes sense. Um, 
uh, I can't remember what lecture it is. Maybe I can put it in, in, in the notes later on. Um, but I, I showed how when you do a, uh, like a bouncing ball, basically I showed it like next to a, a character like that's six, six feet tall and then like next to like a, a pyramid that's like absolutely huge. Uh, I can't remember what that was. Uh, if I remember it, I'll, I'll say it. Anyway, so the point was, Atsushi looked at this and he said like, wow, this looks good. Uh, I don't know what it is about it, but this one looks really good. And I was just, so I was just kind of like happy, you know, to myself because I knew that what I had done with scale um, actually really sold the shot. So anyway, the first thing you want to be thinking about is character scale. And the different problems that can come up is um, the distance that a character needs to travel, uh, you know, from the, di the director's direction is going to kind of like dictate like what's supposed to happen in the scene. And if the scale is not correct or the movement's not correct, you're going to have to do a lot of cheating. Okay, scale of, scale of the scene. And another thing to remember is that you can scale, like any time you have a tracked camera with, with animation information on it and your background plate, scaling up the scene scales down the character and scaling down the scene scales up the character. Think about the scene, the tracked camera, as a shoebox and um, on one end you have the camera and then on, one, on the inside panel of the shoebox you have the plate. All right. So when you scale it up and down and the character stays the same, you're, you're, you're actually changing the scale of the character and not really the, 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 the scene at all. Okay? Because if plate and camera scale at the same time and tra tracking geometry, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Anything that's included in the world, so ground plane, tracking geometry, if you have trees, rocks, whatever, you scale that all together with the camera, then really what you're doing is you're just scaling the character up and down, okay? And that's what you want to do. My next point is that you always want to adjust the, the scene and not the character, okay? Here's why. First is a technical reason. Um, sometimes things are rigged in a way that uh, doesn't scale too well. Some things like cloth uh, don't like to be scaled uh, too much. Some things like hair. Uh, I know shave and a haircut, for instance, has a global scale for the hair that you should probably be scaling with the hair. Um, just connect that attribute. But if you forget or you don't do that or you can't do that for some reason, um, then you're, if you scale the character up, um, really, really big, then the hair is going to get really, really short or thin or both. Uh, another thing is materials. Um, some materials actually use world scale properties. Uh, some uh, diffusion and subsurface scattering materials actually use world scale uh, as their as their, their, their scale, meaning if you have a, uh, something that looks like a candle and the light um, reflects inside and makes it glow from within, well, it's not going to look like a candle if you scale it way up. Why? Because the light's only going to penetrate, you know, just a tiny bit now because the object has been made so big, okay? Um, shadow maps, um, I mean, we use all ray trace lights, but like shadow maps do make a difference if you have a, a, a gigantic scene. Um, it does make a difference. And, and well, other things. Uh, ambient occlusion also uses scene scale. Um, I do believe that Final Gather actually uses image, image uh, dimensions to calculate Final Gather points. That, so that might, not, that might not apply. But there are a lot of things that are connected to the scale of a character. And so char characters, it's fine if you, make a, if, you're, if you made a character that's meant to scale. Like you have a character standing here and you go Poof, and like, whoop, like they shrink and you put them in a bottle or whatever the animation is. That's great. That's fine. And, and whoever is your TD will have to, you know, make sure that the cloth scales and the muscles and the hair, you know, scales and everything and the materials, everything is working fine. But, uh, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about when the animation means they scale. When you're working with plates, you always want to scale the world. So that means that the camera and the tracking geometry and the plate should all be in one group that you scale globally up and down. What helps is if you put the pivot point of that one group at the, foot, the feet of the character where the character is supposed to be at the start of the shot. And then look through the camera but scale it in, in the perspective view. 
And what you'll see is that it almost looks like, I'll do this as well, it almost looks like the character is just scaling up and down. And that's what you're doing. Okay? So scale's extremely important. <clears throat> um, next thing is timing. For timing, um, there's just two major considerations. What is the format that this is going to be displayed on? And um, what is the, um, what is the uh, intention of the, the director? What is supposed to get done, basically, in this um, um, scene? Okay? And those two major considerations um, sometimes are fighting each other a lot. And why you need to be careful about what the display format is, is because, uh, and we were reined in a lot on this, on, on Kong, for instance, um, is when you are sitting in a, a theater and the screen is 40 feet across and your character just goes from left to right really quickly, uh, the audience is, is totally going to miss that. So sometimes th movements are actually slowed down just so that they'll look good in a theater. And um, you need to check with your supervisor, your director, or whoever is in charge of, of this, and, and in your own mind, be kind of cognizant of the, these considerations when you're timing your animation. You can't get away with everything when you have a plate in terms of timing, okay? Also, your timing will look a little weird if you don't take into consideration what has um, been uh, uh, kind of like established for the film as well. So the, uh, the, the, the plate will kind of dictate that as well. Those kind of timing choices. <clears throat> the next thing you need to take into consideration is cameraman movement. I wasn't, to just be totally honest, I wasn't perfectly happy with how things turned out on Kong, on, especially in that, that fight sequence that I told you about. I felt that, again, it was almost like every single shot was a helicopter shot. It's like, how is the camera literally floating 25, 30 feet off the ground? And how, how are we getting this angle? How are we seeing this? I thought that like, there could be a few shots like that, but for the most part, almost everything should have been on the ground looking up at this thing happening and just like crazy. Like, a little bit more like Transformers, they, they, they do that. A lot of times because the characters are running on the ground like they were in Jurassic Park during that Spinosaurus T-Rex fight I told you about. Um, I think that the scale issue is dealt with a lot better on like Transformers than, than uh, so it seems like ILM gets it. Um, you know, I might, I, I don't know, I might be lambasted for, for you know, for saying like, oh, no, I know better than uh, Peter Jackson, you know, you know but I, I think you watch it back and you decide. And let me know. Send me an email if you, if you agree with me or disagree with me. I'd love, I love to debate about these things. Um, but the cameraman movement is extremely important. First thing is that a cameraman, uh, you want it to be like the cameraman is reacting to what's going on on screen and not anticipating what's going on on screen. So when the camera moves, you don't want that to be perfectly centered on your character. You want your character to move and then the cameraman to react to that. So everything you're doing with your character on the plate should be before. It should, it should, it should, it should happen long enough before that everything motivates the camera move. And you'll get that as a note. Your director, supervisor, whatever, will say, um, can we have this timed like this, or can we do this or that, so that it motivates the camera a little bit more. Okay, um, that's, a, that's a big one. And the way you can do this is you can think about your cameraman, think about like literally their, their motivation. And another thing is that a cameraman might, might do something like a zoom, not because something necessarily happened, but because they, they want to anticipate what's going to happen. Cameraman doesn't want to, like the character zips off, the cameraman doesn't want to lose them and then have to find them. So you might find that, like the cameraman will like zoom in. I'll show you a plate that has that. The cameraman might like zoom in and it's not a good idea for you to like time it so that the character goes like rah and then zo it zooms in. Because 
why 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 did the cameraman why did the cameraman zoom in? He's he's probably still a little bit you know nervous that you know he's going to lose the character, right? So rather than there being an action, probably the character um, like maybe like hunkering down and slowing down would give the cameraman the confidence that they're not going to bolt off, and now that's a good time for a, a push in. So it's almost the opposite instinct that you might have for some of the actions that a camera does when you get a plate. So when you're looking at a plate, try to think of the cameraman like at, literally as a thinking, breathing character. All right? the, the camera has been called a character in film. Okay? Um, certainly the camera is a character in, in like point of view films and found footage films like, like Chronicle or, or Cloverfield uh, or Blair Witch, which I think kind of started this whole thing off. Um, camera is def definitely a character, okay? And so you want to think like that. Uh, so like a zoom in is definitely, is definitely you know, th at that point where you think the cameraman would think that it's safe to zoom in and get a little bit more detail and not lose the character. A zoom out is the opposite, right? If, if the character, you know, is hunkering down and doing something and then stands up, then the cameraman might be like, oh, he's going to run and then zoom out, right? It's the opposite thinking. It's the opposite of your instinct because you might think when the character stands up and like faces the cameraman, you would think like, oh, well, now the cameraman is going to want to get more detail. And he's going to zoom way in. No, because the second that character bolts, the cameraman's zoomed in is never going to be able to find that character looking through the, 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 the eyepiece so zoomed in, right? He's not. So again, there's another example where it's the opposite. Also think about, um, we have, like as humans, we have a really, really good sense of trajectory. We do. And we have we have like bouncing ball and, and things like on an arced path, like things in the air, airborne objects. We have a very good, like just built in physics calculator for those kinds of things. So if a character jumps off the roof, the character might get a little bit ahead of the cameraman, but he's pretty much going to be able to find him and lock onto him for the rest of that landing. All right, so it's common for like that the big, the jump to kind of get a little bit ahead, but it but for the rest of that, pretty much you know try to center that that camera, and the cameraman is not stupid. He's not going to think that the character is going to go through the ground, so he's not going to like go past where the character lands. If you find that you get a plate where the cameraman goes past where the character lands, it'll look silly. It'll just look very silly if you have the character land right here and then the camera goes down and looks at the ground and then comes back up. So what you need to do is you need to ha explain that and motivate that camera. Maybe if it's like a transformer, he lands right here, but his hand that's holding like holding a gun or a sword or something like that, like just usually like lands close to camera. So it's like a land right here, but then boom, right here, it lands in front of us. And then he comes back up and, and frames up that, that, that big robot. You see what I'm saying? So always thinking about the cameraman or camera person, could be a, way, a lady, we don't know. Always think about the camera person as a thinking character and you'll be in great shape, okay? So I'll show you a couple plates and, and show you, and, and we'll talk about what the cameraman or person should be thinking or, or was thinking um, at that moment. Uh, let's see here. And then we're going to, um, I'll show you just a few tricks in After Effects if you, if you have After Effects. Um, I love the CS, uh, CS6 Creative Cloud. I think it's amazing. Um, for, at 49 bucks uh, a month, it's, uh, it's affordable, and um, 
Uh, you guys by now know exactly how I feel about you know animators you know being more than just animators being a little bit of a, a, a jack of all trades. Um, I think it's just smart. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll just I'll show you a few things in that because I know everyone doesn't have um, After Effects, but um, it's just good to just know the terminology and know what you're looking for as an animator. Okay, so uh, let's let's first look in. Uh, let's first go in just into Maya here. Here we have a scene, and it has a, a camera. This is a tracked camera, and it has animation information on it. And um, you're pretty much going to get one of these for uh, every single shot that you work on with a with a plate. Okay. This will whichever one. I haven't decided which which scene I'm going to give you guys just to practice with, but um, all of them that are going to be in the store will have. Uh, this and they will all have the plate loaded on and all you have to do is set the project to the folder where you extract this camera and plate and the plate should load up but just in case you don't um, here's how you load it if you go if you select the camera and you go to um, its uh, shape here and then go view image plane import image then just grab the plate uh, from the plate directory and uh, load it and then I'll show you the the settings that you need to use here um, it's a JPEG sequence they were targas but they were like five gigabytes each um, these they are 1920 by 1080 JPEGs though so that's nice um, let's see here let me just create a, a sphere okay um, so they are HD, which is nice. And let me just turn on lighting here. We have our little sphere, okay. And now uh, then what you do is you go into the attribute editor and select the plane shape, and this is what you want to do. First thing is, is that the plate, unless you're using, unless you're putting a mask over it, you don't need to display the alpha. So you should change your display mode to just RGB also want to change display to just looking through camera. You can do all views if you just want to um, check where the depth is of your plate, but it's totally not necessary, especially in, in, in most cases, it's totally not necessary to see your plate um, like in the perspective um, view. And sometimes it just gets in the way because the camera might do a 180 and then you have this gigantic plate flipping around in your scene. It's weird. So display looking through camera is my favorite. Alpha gain is just uh, the, the transparency of your plate. And again, this is if you have tracking geometry that is um, behind the plate uh, for some reason and you want to uh, look at it. Or if you just want to um, have your plate uh, just be a little less um, visible uh, for, for any reason. If you want to like, focus on the silhouette of your character, whatever it is, um, you, can, you can change that. Maya 2013 allows you to load movies, um, but it's not as dynamic as loading an image file sequence. So type image file is fine. And your texture filter is um, basically um, how you're going to render your plates. But you shouldn't render your plate um, in your image. You should turn it off by going display mode none before you render and then just composite your, your, your 3D character in this this case a sphere, composite later back onto the plate instead of rendering your plate. Because basically it um, um, is, is just a way to degrade your plate. Also your plate is included in final gathering calculations, use background materials, all those kinds of things. And it'll slow your scene down if your plate is showing. You want to turn on use image sequence. That's basically the whole reason we're here, is it's going to be a moving plate. Okay. And the image number is what number frame you're on. So you should make sure that you didn't export your plate um, to be um, to be you know basically off of this number, okay? And um, your frame offset is how your uh, your sorry your frame uh, that your plate is going to start on. So if you if you type in uh, 10, then your frame your plate will start on on frame 10. And um, normally you don't need to um, touch this at all because this has been um, set up for you. This setting frame cache is actually very important. This will cache a certain amount of frames in memory so that it'll play back quickly. 
not very many people know this, so they leave it at 12. And what's great about that is that if you go through, I'm just grabbing the timeline and scanning, it just cached these first 12 frames. But now as I drag, see how it goes slow again? And now I go back and forth. It just cached these like five frames. Now six frames, seven frames, eight frames, nine frames. So these are all cached now. But these at the beginning are not cached now. So it's throwing out frames in the cache to cache new frames. You want to set this at whatever frame range you're working at. And this is where Maya starts taking up um, a little bit more RAM. Um, hopefully you have something like four to eight gigabytes minimum on your computer. And with that much RAM, you should be able to cache your entire sequence. Um, but at the very least, if I'm working, let's say, just say frame one through 80, I should be able to um, cache um, 80 frames, okay? And so now, right now, it's um, set to play all frames. So it's going to play all frames and cache them um, as fast as it can and what you'll notice is that as you go through um, this it's playing more frames back at real time um, until it's cached all the frames. The other way you can do it is just play it once through on um, um, play all frames in, in your, your time settings. This shouldn't be maximized. Let me just shrink this a little bit. So you can see the whole Maya window. So on your time settings, if you just change it to play all frames once and then um, play back at real time, um, it should be fine. Now I just realized, I actually am glad, um, I didn't give Sonia the right export settings. So um, here we go. I need, I need to actually start this on uh, frame offset negative one. There we go. Now the ball, see the ball was, was skidding around and it was moving when it wasn't supposed to. Okay? Um, so I, I will fix this before I give you guys any plates. I will make sure that it starts on the correct frame. So don't worry about that. But I'm glad I get to show you frame offset. Okay? So here we have now um, the plate is almost totally cached. You'll see that it, it kind of like skips and bumps um, a couple times and it's stopping on frames that it needs to cache. And um, pretty soon here it's going to be playing just straight through the whole way. There we go. It's pretty much there. And I like, to, I like to not waste time. So normally I know that if I'm working on the first 80 frames like I am right now, I, I know that the character, uh, you know, posing it and whatever, I'm pretty much going to see all 80 of these frames. And so it'll just cache itself by the time I'm ready to watch it back at speed anyway. So I don't know, that, that's just me. So here we have our tracked camera and our plate loaded. And as you can see, that, that sphere is staying um, basically perfectly still, which means that it is actually um, locked in space, that this, this track is, is pretty good. Some of the tracks have little bumps in them, and um, that's okay. What uh, you just need to do is like animate the character um, like, like jumping or hitting the ground or, or, or doing something at that moment. And, and um, I'm not going to give you guys the, the tracks that are like re that have a huge bump in them. I, I wouldn't do that to you. Um, but some of them have just a tiny little bump um, that you can actually fix in comp or you can fix the camera um, yourself just by hand keying over it. But the bumps are introduced when we have to track two different cameras and then kind of glue the, the information together. But anyway, as you can see, Playing back, now we have um, pretty awesome, uh, pretty awesome track on on, on this uh, this object. This plate would be good. Um, we use this for a, a creature that was basically a gigantic bat. Um, this plate would be good for anything that um, is a cave dweller. Um, you could have it climbing up the walls, and then jumping up um, to the ceiling and hanging down or whatever. Um, that's kind of what we did. We had it holding on to the wall here, and then it jumps off and flaps up and kind of um, floats up in the air. So I'm going to um, load the, um, I'm going to load just the, the MP4 preview of, of this plate so we can talk a little bit more about it and we don't have to cache all the frames. So here we have the plate. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the kind of the considerations that, um, that uh, we've been talking about. So this is a pretty big camera movement. 
there, um, I'm going to give you guys some plates uh, that that uh, you know they'll be available in the store that are a lot more camera movement. But this is a pretty pretty decent camera movement, and that's pretty that's pretty quick as well. So basically, it does look like the character is going off screen and motivating this this move, okay, and then moving around such that the cameraman is thinking, trying to keep the, the character framed up nice and center, and then does something that makes it so that the cameraman now feels that it's safe to zoom in. Um, so maybe this little formation right here, maybe the character um, goes right here and then turns around and then kind of like starts like fitting himself into this corner, like perching or, or, or doing something like that and uh, the cameraman follows him, right? So let's, let's, let's look at this and see if we can really think like the cameraman here. Although that is kind of a big move at the end. Not super big, but it is a little bit like the cameraman is, is well, this is what we should do. We should make it so that the cameraman maybe stops zooming in because the character is um, doing something else. So around this moment would be a good time for a change in behavior of the character so that it's like, oh, maybe I should not zoom in too much more because oh, now he's turning and going the other way or something right at the tail of the shot. Okay, I can't show you guys the final the final animation that we we did on these plates um, because uh, you know that's part of the show. But um, uh, but here you have it. Okay, so here's a plate. Here's another plate. It's got uh, it's got a big move on it. Let's see here. Uh, this one. And as you can see, we're we're working up dozens here. Um, how many folders are there? 33 so far, and there's, there's more to come. And we have forests, we have caves, we have, we have like uh, riverbeds, we have, we have a lot. This is one of my, my, my favorite plates, and I might actually have the mask for the tree that I can give you. Don't, don't uh, be upset if I don't, uh, but I, you know, sometimes we don't archive everything, but I might actually be able to give you the mask of the, the corn, this side of this tree here as well. Anyway, so check this one out. We're looking around, looking around, and then whoop, big zoom, big zoom, and then a pan left to right, and then another quick zoom, okay? So, uh, so what could possibly be the thinking here? Well, I like it. I think what we kind of did on this was the, char the character pops out right here, and the cameraman just wants to get him. And as he uh, moves out, he suddenly turns and, and, and kind of darts um, away, but then stops. And that stop is what motivates this second zoom. It's like, oh, we need to, you know, before he jumps over this log, we've got to get a close look at him. And it doesn't matter if he, you know, jumps off of camera. It doesn't matter because, we, you know, we've only seen him for like two seconds. We need, to, we need to get all we can get. So this is kind of thinking of the cameraman as almost more of like a desperate cameraman, almost more of a, uh, a cameraman that's getting, uh, getting all the footage that he can rather than trying to make sort of like a beautiful composition out of it. You know, it's the difference between a cameraman that's shooting, you know, gorillas in the mist, you know, like a, or like, you know, a Disney animal documentary and a cameraman that's like out there just capturing the moment, you know? So if it's the Disney one, he's going to, you know, frame it up and just like it, it would make his day if the gorillas just enter from, from frame right and just hold that camera and just a slow pan over and then they move in and stop and then he frames them nice and left and he's got this gorgeous valley over here and, and everything works out perfectly. In this one, it's a little bit more like, oh my God, turn on the camera, like what, what is that? And, and zoom and find it. Okay, so always thinking about what your, your cameraman is doing. Um, here's the plate that I uh, told you about. Um, hopefully it's done by now. What was it called? I think it was called Arika, yeah. So, um, and we're renaming these. They're, they're named right now by the creature that they were, not the, not the plate, sorry. 
Okay, so here's the plate. It's just basically like a really, uh, it's like a desert at dusk. And look at the, what this camera is doing. Okay, so it's basically scanning around and he can be doing one thing and one thing. Actually, no, he'd be doing a, a few things, but uh, what the client wanted was something very specific. The client wanted the character to start almost like appearing from behind this hill way over there. And this, this dinosaur was like, you know, five feet tall at his head, like 12 feet long, but like five feet tall. So if it's all the way over behind this hill, he's only like, you know, like filling up this area. Then the client, this is what they wanted. I'm going to uh, move my mouse. So he was running this way and then he turns and runs back this way. Okay. And then um, when he gets to this point, turns and then again and then runs down this kind of like, uh, uh, what do you call this, path right here. Okay, let me, let me try to get the timing again. Down this path right here, he runs, 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 turns, comes back, and then runs right at camera, and then boom, like eats camera right at this moment. So w once we stop right here, it's like this slow movement from right to left is not coming to a stop because he's like calmly, you know, ch changing directions, kind of like he was again. It's because he's actually rounding a corner and his, his, the curve of his movement is actually coming into a, like a, a real slow in, but he's still running super fast and running right towards us. So this was an extremely difficult scale issue because if he starts way back here, he needs to be running like at 40 miles an hour to make it all the way over here like he's motivating the camera and then turn and come back. So we had to make him, we ended up, the decision was, we had to make him run really like parallel to camera and only at the very end, like turn and come straight at camera because this like slow kind of like, like a river kind of like meandering towards us would not work. The only other thing we, you could do with this plate um, is be tracking a, cam, a character that's standing right here, okay? And that's pretty big thinking about scale, um, so the horizon, so that it feels like the cameraman is six feet tall looking directly at the horizon, so anything that's at the horizon um, by definition, um, maybe you guys don't know that, maybe I should just draw that real quick. Stand by. <clears throat> um, sorry about that, okay, so if you have your camera right here at the, and the it's facing straight, then everything that lines up on this line is the same height from the ground as the camera person. So if this is six feet, then this is six feet as well, right? So you can tell basically, sort of basically, um, by looking at the horizon how tall something is, okay? So looking right here, the middle of the, the, this plate is the horizon. So if you have a character standing and his feet are right here and he's like this tall, then it's like 10, 10 foot tall character. So this would be good for a transformer like grung, 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 right here because it's actually pretty good movement for tracking something that's a lot closer to camera. The client just wanted him really far away and running up towards us. But if, he, if the character was in mid ground, like standing right here, this is actually a very good plate for that kind of action. Okay, let's look at, look at a few more and then I'll show you um, a few more things uh, uh, within Maya that, uh, that will work for you. So this is a really cool plate. So we have this foreground tree that's um, hiding the character and this is, a, this is extreme amount of, like I said, that cameraman that's just trying to get the action. See, he, he peeks out and what does he see? You know, is there something right there? Oh, zooms in because it's not moving, right? You wouldn't want to zoom in on a character that's moving, right? So he zooms in on it. Not ran out of RAM. Anyway, so let's watch this at speed. Oh, what is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, what's that? You know, a lot of, like, the, the feeling behind this plate is a huge amount of discovery. It really feels like discovery. Um, here's a uh, cool plate. This plate has uh, a character landing on the ground um, and we really liked um, animating this one 
um, because we got to do some, uh, some, uh, some wings with end cloth, which was a lot of fun. So it starts in the air. And one thing you need to be really careful about in the air is that you make it look good um, to um, camera. I'm actually glad. I, wasn't, I, I didn't know which um, plates I was going to open. I was just going to go through a couple. I'm really glad I opened this one up. The thing with Excuse me, the thing with flying characters is when you lose your frame of reference, like when you lose the trees and there's not like really contrasty clouds that show you exactly what you're looking at, um, the camera can all of a sudden make the flight path of the character look really, really bad. Because the, if the camera is jittering and you have no frame of reference, the, that character is going to be like kind of like zigzagging all over screen. And it kind of does happen on this shot. We cheated this one huge amount. So the way you do that is you animate the character, the flying character, in the air doing like the best flight path you can imagine. Then what you do is you constrain the character's master controller to a locator and then go in camera and sort of do a locator kind of screen like camera arc pass on top of that animation that you have. And normally a blend between the two is uh, good enough that the, uh, the audience, the eye, will forgive little bumps and, 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 and jitters and whatever. So um, definitely, definitely, definitely uh, be aware of the fact that that frame of reference, those, those trees or, or whatever, and it's only gone for a second here. It, it, you only lose it, see, you do get those clouds that come into screen, but those aren't so super contrasty that you're going to get you know, so much. And, and it's weird because look, we come up, we go to the side, but then it looks like we're going straight up the direction that those clouds come in. But then when we come back down, we lose the frame of reference pretty strongly and then we f find out that we're actually going much more laterally than we are going down. It's much more of a pan than it is like a tilt, isn't it? So we lose that frame of reference for just like five or six frames, but when we get it back again, it's a totally different movement than we kind of expect. Let's watch it at speed. Maybe you'll see what I'm talking about. We look up, and then it's like when we come back down, it's actually going much more from right to left than actually down. You see that? So that was actually screwing us up a little bit on this plate, and it was when we did that sort of overall kind of cheat the arc to camera pass, that things started looking a lot better. I might include this one. This is, this is probably a good one to, to include for you guys. Um, though I am going to make sure that the track is nice and tight on the, ones that, the one that I include in this, in this, um, this lecture. Okay. Um, let's look at just a few more. Let's see here. Uh, Ooh, this is a good one. This one's in a river. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that, well, I mean, if you have real flow, it's, it's pretty easy. But the interesting thing about this is that being in the water means that the character is um, kind of moving uh, a lot slower and for the cameraman, a lot more predictably. So you would think to yourself, okay, first of all, we start the scene with a rack focus. See that? start on this, these little uh, shafts of wheat and then we go to the, or grass or weeds or whatever, and we go to the, the, the riverbed, all right? So what that tells me is that this guy is setting the shot up to be a little bit more cinematic. So whatever animation you do in this one, it should be a lot more predictable, okay? So it would look, for instance, it would look crazy and ridiculous if you had the character like darting left and right and doing all these crazy motions when it's like, wait a second, there's not, there's really not anything motivating there. Or, or, or if that's in there, the camera's gonna be a lot different. And he probably wouldn't start with a rack focus. So always thinking about the way the cameraman um, is thinking, okay? Hey, I never noticed this before, but there's actually, a, uh, there's actually an animal in the water over here. Oh my God. This is, this is hilarious. This is hilarious because this show is about finding creatures. And like this little thing pops its head up and then disappears over there. I'm gonna send this back to the client and say, do you realize that you, you actually found a creature? 
maniacs. All right, um, cool. So uh, let's, let's, let's just look at one more. This is addictive. I just get so excited about this. Um, okay, we've got riverbed, a slow zoom out. Oh, and then a zoom in. Oh, that's really cool. Mm, I love that little, that quick little push in. So this is a great one. You can have the character start, maybe come from around here and jog out to the middle, and then like kneel down. And then right when he kneels down, then the cameraman says, oh, what's he gonna do? And then, and then zooms in. So always thinking about the cameraman. Always thinking about motivating the camera and keeping the cameraman a thinking character that's doing something in the scene, participating in the scene, okay? So I showed you how to load a plate. Um, a few more things that you need to know is that besides the frame cache, normally what you want to do is set uh, your, your placement to fit to resolution gate um, and uh, view your resolution gate by clicking on this um, button up here. And uh, if you set your render settings correctly, these are HD plates. So any HD aspect ratio, which is um, 1.778 or 96540, 1280 by 720 or 1920, 1080, any uh, HD aspect ratio will display this plate correctly. Okay, the last thing is, is depth. Now the scene scale is different on all these shots, but if you find yourself not being able to see any of your objects, but if you hit four, um, actually you know what? You actually have to turn off uh, cameras to see it. Uh, I thought you could look through the plate if you hit four, no. Nope. So if you turn off cameras and it's right there, that means that the depth of your plate is, is too close. And um, so let me show you what depth um, what depth actually means. Um, if you go to through look in all views, there's the plate, okay? So if you have your depth too close, the plate is literally a plane blocking the view of the camera. You want it behind all your objects at all times. So setting your depth to like a thousand normally is good. Um, but here, I'm, uh, you know, this is what I was talking about. You know, sometimes it's super annoying to see your plate in all views. You know, like if your character was right here, like how annoying would it be to just like, oh, all this plate in the way. So that's why I like to just show it looking through camera. And a thousand depth is normally um, good. Um, the coverage, um, coverage origin and the offsets uh, are if you really, really necessarily have to get um, just a portion of the plate to um, be displayed. Um, don't do that for now. You're, you, there's really nothing else that you need to uh, worry about um, with, the, with the plates. Um, and you're not going to be rendering your plates, you're going to be rendering just your objects and then um, compositing them back on top of the plate so the render stats are not, um, not uh, important either, um, uh, really at all. Oh, you know what, there was a, here's the one more that I wanted to show you. Um, I, I'll see if we have the uh, my file that has all the leaves that get spit up because um, we had them run down and kick up the leaves and then jump over and land right here and then walk towards us. Um, it turned out really, really, really cool looking. And um, so I'll see if I can get you all that stuff. But this is one of those. See this big bump right here? You have to have your character in air during this big bump because we tracked one camera, him running down the hill, and then another camera, him starting right here because the, uh, the two different um, motions, that big zoom out, and then this, this you know, bumpy walking camera just did not track well together. So um, there is a, there's a big bump in this camera, but you can, you can work it out if you just have, you time them to be in air on that moment. Um, so this is a really cool one, and I'll try to give you guys the uh, interaction on this one, okay? Um, cool, so let's just look at a few more things. Um, you know how to load your, your plate. You know how to uh, animate your character so that, the, that the, it looks like it's motivating the cameraman. You know that the cameraman is a thinking, breathing character with motivations and thoughts and he's going to be making decisions about where the camera is pointing. You know about scale and timing. You know you can't get away with every single timing on every single format. Okay, um, now I'm just going to show you a few things. Uh, what you want to do to make a uh, piece of geometry that the character casts a shadow on is you're going to want to create um, use background materials. Um, here is uh, just a simple dome. 
If you go to um, your Hypershade, and mine is open right now, here we go. If you go to your Hypershade, and then you uh, just create a, a use background and select the uh, select the the the, the new uh, what do you call this object? Um, for a dome like this, you probably don't want it to cast shadows because then it'll get in the way of itself. And then when you're creating your spotlights and your point lights and whatever, it does look like these are already casting shadows. Let's see here. Yeah, this is ray trace shadows. Um, you just want to make sure that um, all the geometry that you want to cast a shadow is and all the, the ones that you don't are not. So I'm just going to push this right up into that um, use background material and I'm going to render it with the background so you can just see what's going on. But um, when, you're, when you're actually rendering it, you want to again turn off the, uh, the plate because um, as you can see, it's actually calculating the plate right now. It's using, it's using the, uh, uh, the information from that plate to do calculations, whereas um, if you turn it off, then the, the, the object is actually um, not calculated at all. Let's see here. All right, so the, the light is actually kind of down here, and it's, it's casting up this way. All right, so let's, um, let's delete these lights so you can just um, see a little bit of a better example and just, just re-render this region. So, um, so there you have it. There's the object casting on uh, the use background. Oh yeah, one more thing. Use background by default has reflections, so turn off reflectivity and um, just use the shadow mask. If you want to, you, you can use the use background for the, the water, if you have a character walking in water and you can make um, reflections that way. Um, but for th these reasons, uh, we're not going to. The specular color only affects the reflectivity. Okay, so you don't have to worry about specular color if all you want is the shadow. So I'm just going to re-render this and the, the reflection, yeah, there you go, is taken out. So there you have it. Um, you're going to want to create use background materials and geometry that matches your plate. This obviously it doesn't look realistic at all because the, I mean, I mean just look at it, there, it's casting a, a soft, you know, perfectly round shadow on this jagged wall. That makes no sense. Um, one thing though is that you probably want to get a little bit of um, um, color depth. So your shadow color, you can always color correct it down, but um, working with that shadow edge, um, you probably want to make sure that your shadow color is not totally black um, because you can, o again, you can always push it downwards, um, but you can't, you don't necessarily um, have the ability to, um, to bring it back. Actually, on use background materials, I'm sorry, the shadow mask controls the, it controls the darkness. I'm sorry. So if shadow mask is one, you're going to have a totally black shadow. So if you turn it down like 0.7 or whatever, you can always color correct it back to where it's supposed to be, but you get a little bit more, um, you know, information, um, you know, on the side there, okay? So let me just um, maybe even take it down to 0.5. No, that's, not, that's not enough. Okay. And then once you're ready to render for final, um, you'll um, select your camera. You'll select your image plane shape. Go to display mode none. And then when you render this, you'll see that the shadow is basically an alpha on the blackness, meaning that it is basic, basically showing you black um, wherever there is this alpha, and that's that's fine for shadow. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Another thing is is that contact shadow um, really sells a um, really sells a uh, 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 an image. The way you do that is you make an ambient occlusion pass. Select both your objects, both your, your tracking, your geometry and your, your character geometry and create a new layer, new render layer. Select it, right click on it and go to attributes. This is the quickest way to do it. You can do it custom, but this is the, definitely the fastest way. And then on that layer selected in the attribute editor, go to presets, occlusion. Um, and there's only two more steps. You don't want the tracking geometry to occlude itself. You want just that point where the where the object occludes the tracking geometry, that contact point. And the way you do that is with the mental images label or the MI label, okay? 
Uh, mental images makes mental rays, so it's called MI label. The way you do that is go to edit, uh, add attribute, and the long name is MI and then capital label. I like to select that and then override long name, um, make it the same thing. Um, integer is what you want. Minimum, zero, maximum, uh, like 50, doesn't matter, and the default is zero, okay? You want to do that for all objects that have um, occlusion or are in the occlusion layer, okay? And I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you in just a second why, okay? And what ambient occlusion basically is, is darkness in the cracks, okay? So the two channels we're going to be looking at is ID include exclude and ID non-self. Any ID that is listed in here is going to be included in the um, calculation. Any ID that is negative, so if it's like negative five, it's going to be excluded from the calculation. And then again, any ID that is non-self, or sorry, any ID that's included in this uh, attribute of non-self will not occlude itself. So basically, what we want is we want the sphere to occlude the background geometry, but the background geometry not occlude the sphere because then the sphere would be totally black, right? So, the way we do this um, is uh, we go to ID, we make the ID of include and exclude, um, uh, let's say, negative five, so it's excluded, okay, and then non-self would be um, five. So now anything with a label of five, and I've, I've put a label of five on this sphere, anything with a label of five, this one has the label of zero, by the way, okay, so anything with a label of five will not occlude itself and is not included in the occlusion, okay? So let me just render this, and as you can see, we have that contact shadow on the, on the top of the cave here where the, where the sphere is touching it, okay? So let's, uh, let's just take a real quick look. I know this is not um, um, entirely the, uh, the, the focus of this uh, uh, you know, website or even this talk. But um, it is kind of important to me to know that you guys are getting um, a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of uh, help, a little bit of experience uh, doing um, some things other than, you know, just animating sometimes. Um, so uh, what you can do is um, if you drop your plate into After Effects, um, you can make a pretty quick mat for your character by using the um, roto brush tool. The way it works is you just double click on the layer, select the roto brush tool, which is up here, and then just paint where you want your mask to go. And it will kind of intelligently um, select stuff. And you can use Alt to fix the, um, the, that roto edge. Um, this is kind of a difficult um, plate because it's so close. Um, might be a little bit easier if we like go up here for instance. Okay, see there we go. All right, so let's just imagine. If you hit spacebar, it plays forward and actually tracks until it loses it and then you have to set a new keyframe basically. So just paint again. Okay, and then you can hit spacebar again. And just when it loses it, um, I think it tr actually just intelligently tracks um, a certain number of frames. You just hit spacebar, okay? So now we have basically a rough edge. You can use the smoothing factor and the feather to give yourself a little bit more of a nicer um, edge. You can use the choke as well uh, to do the same thing. Refining the mat, uh, reducing chatter means from frame to frame, it's not going to um, have as much, um, you know, jumping around as much, okay? And then um, using motion blur, I mean, that's just, uh, if you want to uh, make sure that um, if there's a big camera movement that the mat actually blurs as well. And so if I import a solid here and put it behind, you can see that for these first couple frames, we've actually masked out, um, masked out that, uh, that, that line there, okay? So if I put this 
plate behind the plate that we just masked. Now look what I can do. Imagine this um, white solid is actually your character moving through screen. Imagine this is the animation of your character. Transform position to scan through and he just cruises through and goes behind here. Just imagine this is your character jumping behind that tree. You see that? Okay, so it's super, super easy to get um, at least a rough mask in, in um, After Effects. And what you'll want to do so that you can see this in your scene is you'll want to export this. So just display that layer. Um, I'm going to make this a um, ping sequence, PNG, um, RGB and alpha. Okay. And then I'm going to export this. I'm just going to export this locally for now, but you'll want to export this in your same directory as your plate so that you can um, see it. And one thing to know is that Maya needs a period, not an underscore before the uh, numbers. So you have to change the default formatting for um, After Effects. And so now in Maya, what we'll want to do is we'll want to do this. Let's make a new scene. Let me um, create a new camera. And then um, on this camera's image plane, we will first import the, the first image, okay? And um, this will be the background plate. Okay, remember to um, uh, make sure that you're um, using image sequence, okay? Um, use image sequence, here we are. And so now, here it is, cruising through. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I'll set my cache later. Doesn't matter to cache right now. My depth is 100, let's make it like 1,000, okay? And now, I'm gonna create a sphere. Here's my sphere. And I'm gonna move it up here. And now to load my plane, or my, my mat, I'm going to import another image as an image plane. You can have as many as you want, which is kind of cool. Okay, and then I'm going to find the mat. Here it is. All right, so now if I set my depth to something like one, which is right close to the camera, you'll see the object in the scene actually is masked by my um, by my uh, my background. So what you'll want to do is make sure that if you have some tracking geometry that it is moving with your plate, but you can also get um, a, a pretty quick mask to give you that to give you that uh, information pretty easily um, if you just follow the steps that I that I just showed you. All right, well that should pretty much do it. Remember, first and foremost, scale is an extremely important issue. You have to make a very conscious choice to, to handle the scale in a way that's smart. You can't have a gigantic character crossing through a slow plate without uh, repercussions, and you also can't have a, uh, a uh, character, uh, a, a small character moving uh, too quickly in a, uh, or even in a fast plate. It, it really does come down to how the uh, direction, what the direction of the character is supposed to be and how your audience is supposed to react to what's going on. I'm still, uh, fuck. So there you have it. Um, obviously a lot to go over, um, really just, but it, it breaks down to a few simple ideas. First, scale is very important. You are really dealing with scale once you introduce a plate because there are, there's a frame of reference and there's also basically area where the character is supposed to be moving. Um, how fast that character is supposed to be moving is dictated by the director choice, but at the same time you need to make sure that you aren't breaking reality. Like a character has a 50 foot stride length in order to, to get from one point to the other or is passing through uh, geometry or passing through trees or objects or rocks or whatever it is um, in order to, to satisfy the movement that's been asked of you. Also, um, 
you want to make sure that the scale uh, really like lends itself and supports the character choice. You know, a camera looking down shouldn't probably be looking at a large character because that'll make it feel small. And consequently, a camera looking up should probably be looking at that large character making it feel big and not at a small character making it look small. Timing is also very important. You can't time things that are too quickly. You're constrained a little bit by your plate and you have to match the timing kind of to the way the plate um, has been shot. Also, we talked about thinking like the cameraman. I think we covered that in enough depth that, uh, that you know exactly uh, what to do. So that's, uh, that's uh, you know, covered um, pretty well. But just if you can, imagine you are the cameraman. And what would you be thinking? How are you going to be motivated by what you're seeing? And the more you can really make that like, work together and be like a marriage, between the, the thinking cameraman and the, and the moving character, uh, the better, um, definitely. You want to be um, thinking a lot about how your uh, character is going to um, kind of like trick the cameraman and uh, also how the cameraman is going to want to anticipate um, what's going on. He wants to be a good cameraman and get the shot. So those are also things to think about with the cameraman movement. Um, it's pretty easy to load a plate. I showed you just import image, change it to use image sequence, set your depth so it's behind all of your objects. Um, normally you don't need the alpha unless you're using a plane like we just did that has a, mat, that has a mask uh, so that you can put it in front of um, some char characters. Um, use background material is great for casting shadows. Setting an ambient occlusion um, layer is also great for um, rendering that contact shadow if you have a character walking on the ground or climbing on the ceiling, whatever it is. And um, last but not least, um, I showed you just a little bit um, on how to create a mask um, in After Effects. You can use the mask tool, the pen tool in After Effects. It's just a lot slower. Um, I find it. this is this is great, you know, it's perfect for like a garbage mat. It, there's no reason at all that, it, you know, you need to go any more complicated than that until you go into uh, compositing. So um, that's pretty much it. Working with plates can be a lot of fun, um, but really the only thing that will really get you up to speed is by practice. So I'm going to choose one, maybe two, uh, plates that have uh, tracking information. I'm going to give you those um, within this, uh, uh, within the zip file and uh, you'll be able to play with those and then the rest will start filing into the store and you can just download them and, and play with them um, however you like. So I really appreciate you watching this um, lecture. Um, good luck, have fun with your animation and as always, rock on.